faithfulness Oh God my Father There is no shadow of turning with me Thou changes not Thy compassions they fail not As Thou hast been Thou forever will be Summer and winter Springtime and harvest Sun, moon and stars In their courses above Joy Jesus' disciples were full of burning questions that needed answers to settle quarrels and clear up misunderstandings. But Jesus often answered with a bewildering question or parable rather than a direct answer. Things got even more befuddling after Jesus' death and resurrection. Confusion reigned among Christians. They desperately wanted answers on liturgy and theology and structure and more. So Paul diligently, lovingly, and sometimes even pointedly answered them in most of the letters, but whole congregations were sickened by virulent forms of conflict, misunderstanding, and plain old sin. Christendom today is still quite ill and susceptible to even minor ailments. The vaccine is love, of course, but love seems to be in short supply in some churches. Thus we have little immunity from disease. Soon dreaded and invasive parasites of division and prejudice can wend its way into the hearts and lives of churches. These pathogens can ravage faith and, if left untreated, can hollow out an afflicted church. The symptoms are easily detected. Absences, apathy, indifference, prejudice, and stony hearts are apparent to most clinicians and even casual observers. Smart ones know that they cannot combat nor defeat these spiritual afflictions with their own feeble devices, and so they look for an antidote. They seek clear and unambiguous treatments in books and prayer and in scripture readings. Yet answers can still be elusive and easy prescriptions are scarce. Truthfully, we lo often long for a fast-acting magical elixir to heal us from our painful infirmities and chronic frustrations, but few viable potions exist. Most ailments can't be treated with a simple fix. Instead, they often require hard work and diligence and humility and outside help. So after exhausting traditional remedies for answers, some finally turn to spiritual directors and advisors and coaches and consultants who may have the talents and expertise to excise the malignancies and aid in their recoveries. I have a friend and colleague who coaches pastors and churches to get past their brokenness and who guides them to a place of healing and restoration. In this uneasy and unprecedented time, her expertise is acutely needed. Hi, this is Pastor Don Chipley, and I'm delighted to have a dear friend of mine, Mary Cyphers, to come on for an interview. She's a coach and consultant and lives down in California. Mary, could you please introduce yourself? Hi, Don. Thank Hi. you for this opportunity, and hello Pleasure. to your people. Um, I'm Mary Cyphers, as you said. I'm an ordained United Methodist pastor like Don. As a matter of fact, that's where we met when we were mm -hmm. colleagues in the Pacific Northwest. Um, I've been a member of the California Pacific Annual Conference for uh, close to 13 years now and have been running a coaching and church consulting business here called Mary Cyphers Ministries for about 12 years. And I work with leaders um, from small businesses, nonprofits, and churches who want uh, leadership coaching and support in their work and their ministry, and then also with churches who are going through uh, needs for visioning and strategy in times of change and growth. Well, I bet, I imagine you've got plenty of work to do. There are plenty I, of challenges that face the churches and pastors face. It was challenging enough a year ago, and it has suddenly become exponentially challenging. Right. One of the reasons why I wanted to talk to you is your response to dealing with COVID-19 and how the churches are 
adapting to that. But let's begin with having a conversation about some of the common challenges that both pastors and churches are facing and how you offer support and what's, what are the remedies, what are the fixes that are typically found? Well, the fixes are many and varied, but the problems, oddly enough, are not that varied. Mm -hmm. um, most, most of the common challenges and the reason I was called to this work to begin with are around um, change and transition. Um, human beings are a funny lot in that we are created for adaptability and change, mm -hmm. but we quickly resist adaptability and change because we like to get into comfort. Um, as a matter of fact, I was just working with a staff parish relations committee yesterday, and uh, I said, what's the biggest challenge? And she said, we really like the rut that we are living in, and we've liked it for a very long time. Right. And I said, I think most human beings are that way. And certainly in the pandemic, we're learning that there is power and beauty in the rut and the mm -hmm. routine. But there is also possibility of tragedy and turmoil when we get stuck in the rut. So I would say that's kind of the common theme that has run through much of my ministry, not just in these last 12 years, but in the last 27 years, even whenever I was pastoring local churches. Yeah. Uh, so it's exacerbated is now, but... That's the way it is. Sure. So what is the usual push or nudge that shows people out of the rut and forces them to consider changes or transformation? What, what typically is the precursor, the catalyst to get, this, get things moving? Uh, pain. At some point, the rut becomes painful. Um, if we keep with that imagery, it's, you know, you're fine if you're cycling um, on a rut in a mountain bike or in an old dilapidated truck on a dirt road until you hit a mud puddle and you're stuck. Or if you're on a mountain bike, if you hit a bump and you go head first off your bike, okay. it's now it's painful. And that's what I find either people get stuck and the pain of being stuck in the rut is causing them pain or they get bounced out of the rut into a completely unexpected situation, which is certainly what most of us have felt in this pandemic. Like whatever rut we were in, we definitely got kicked out of right. when this pandemic hit. All right. So we're going to, get, going to come back to COVID in a minute. So what are the typical challenges that, aside from the need for uh, people who are comfortable in the rut, what are the typical things that you're coaching people? Uh, typically, I am coaching people around um, finding a vision and a purpose for their life or for their church or for their business. Um, people start, again, if they're stuck in that rut, any of us, we get into, you know, we forget why we're doing what we're doing mm -hmm. or it starts to not feel life giving anymore. So a lot of times people turn to me or churches turn to me because they've lost their sense of purpose and mission and vision. Mm -hmm. And the other time people turn to me is whenever they have that vision or they have that yearning to change, but they can't figure out the steps to get there. They need strategy. They need implementation plans or they need somebody to kind of push them along. So they keep doing what they know they want to be doing, sure. but the rut keeps pulling them away from the new things they want to do. So that's where I love to work with people, helping them discern their purpose, their call, their vision, and then helping them create whatever emerges from that. So let's talk about COVID-19. What's, uh, what kind of counsel and coaching are you offering up for people to deal with this uh, really unprecedented event? Well, it certainly um, has uh, in intensified uh, the need for support partners and friends along the way. Um, and one of my favorite scriptures is from Ecclesiastes. It was a scripture that my husband and I had read at our wedding, but boy, it has emerged even more importantly in this time of COVID, and it's from Ecclesiastes 4, beginning with verse 9, um, two are better than one mm. because they have good reward for their toil. And mm. what I have found in COVID is um, we desperately need that kind of support. The scripture goes on to say, if either of them falls down, one can help the other up, but woe to the one who falls and has no one to help them up. And I think in COVID, a lot of us have learned, wow, I've been trying to go this alone. And most of us have fallen at some point along the way in COVID and realized I can't keep going that way. Um, the scripture goes on to say, if two lie together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? 
Mm -hmm. The one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. And then it ends with my favorite verse, a cord of three strands is not easily broken. And for me, that third strand is God. And mm -hmm. so what I have found is people come to me thinking they need my support and I can give them my support, but the most powerful thing is to help them renew and, and rest again in the loving arms of God, who is always there to support us, that wind beneath our wings or the wings that hold us up mm -hmm. so that we don't fall. And that has been a, an ongoing theme is, I, I don't know that any of us actually feel we're all in this together. It's a great catchphrase, right. but I think most of us feel like I'm going through this alone. And so if for a little moment each week I can help someone not be going through it alone and remind them God is also going through them with it, going through this with us, um, then they can get through another week. Yeah. I'm sort of reminded of pastors like to call, call themselves shepherds. And typically shepherding is a solitary, independent, isolating kind of work. But in this case, they need to unionize and cooperate because... <laughs> they need the company and companionship and support of fellow shepherds. The same I think would apply if we want to work with this metaphor to churches as well, if they continue to operate in silos uh, and sort of independent from everybody else, then they're weaker than if they were working collect cooperatively with another church. Amen. Absolutely, Don. Um, I think community is the, um, the antidote for the isolation and the fear that this pandemic has created. That we can connect, and you're right, not just individuals connecting, but churches connecting with other churches, uh, people connecting with other people, neighbors connecting with neighbors, business owners connecting with other business owners and figuring out together. I, the restaurant industry has really captured my admiration yes. for the way in which they have adapted and evolved. But when I talk with restaurant owners, they tell me they're, they're learning from each other. Sure. They're not learning this on their own. So can you give us some examples of some positive results of this COVID-19 of these churches or pastors connecting in new ways and producing new approaches to do ministry? Well, it took us some time. Yeah. <laughs> I would say initially <laughs> all of us jumped into the Lone Ranger awesome. approach. And the to bring yet another new imagery, it felt like we thought we could sprint to Easter. And I don't know if you remember that, but I remember thinking, maybe we'll be back together for Easter Sunday. Right. And it occurred to me in that first month that we were shut down uh, to reach out and ask my colleagues what they're doing. I mean, I even had coaching clients and it didn't occur to me to tell them, hey, reach out and see what your neighbors are doing. We were just mm -hmm. all in such panic mode. Right. But spring, we started realizing we can't do this alone. And I saw more and more colleagues making time to pick up the phone and connect with maybe colleagues they hadn't talked with in years, or maybe colleagues that they only see at annual conference or at a church business meeting and make, be more intentional to reach out. And I saw it with my parishioners too, that I would hear them talk about, you know, I, I finally called so-and-so that I haven't talked with in months, or I was worried because I wondered if so-and-so was sheltering at home alone and they might need some companionship. Mm -hmm. And so that reaching out then kind of expanded late this summer, I really saw more and more of us starting to lean on each other, um, saying, I'm so tired of my own worship services, can I be your? Or I'm so tired of being the only one that takes food to mom at the nursing home, I'm gonna call my sister and ask her to help. Or I'm gonna call my neighbor and ask them to go visit mom, even if it has to be across the parking lot, you know, waving and not actually able to talk, more and more of us reaching out and saying, hey, how can I help you? And here's how you can help me. And creating that, that community sense that the early church knew because they had to know it. Right. And that in modern times in North America, where we're so privileged by our, our self-sufficiency, mm -hmm. um, that sometimes we've forgotten that community and partnership and collaboration is the role model that God gives us, right? The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, Creator, Redeemer, Sustainer, even God is an example of relationality. Sure. So what you're telling me is something that I've been wrestling with since the very beginning, which I struggle with what church is in the midst of COVID because church, in my simplest definition, would be a community. 
and then we were just broken apart. We were separated by distances and doors and so on and mass. And ultimately, it, it, for me, it threatened the whole idea of community. Can we still have a community intact in the midst of all of our separation? What you're telling me is that there's hope that we can still find community even in our separation. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, a personal example I would have in our household from a millennial is my son, who was a, an extreme introvert. Um, when he was about 12, uh, he joined an online uh, chat group of poets, 12 year old poets. And I think a friend of his in his English class knew he was writing poetry. And she said, oh, I have this little chat room group. I can't yeah. call, but it was their, an internal social media group. Yeah. Uh, it's five or six kids across the country who were writing poetry and share. And it was safe for them to share their poetry across the internet in a way that it might not be in your seventh grade junior high classroom, right? Yeah. Um, and he learned so much about how to communicate hmm. and how to kind of uh, 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 what do I want to say, connect with his creative genius um, and to get support from friends. And I saw his communication skills expand. His in-person communication skills got better and better over the coming years. And I think it started with that online poetry group. We can be in community across the phone or um, across the internet or through cards and notes and letters. And I'm reminded in America, if you're Euro-American, that's how we had to communicate were cards and letters that were sent months earlier that, you know, you would send back East to family or over the Atlantic ocean. Um, while, you know, the settlers were coming across this country, they were very alone. They would create a small community within their family, but they would still connect with family through cards and letters. Um, thank heavens for the Pony Express in those days. Mm -hmm. But now we have a way of connecting, you know, through email and cards and letters, but also video conference or phone calls. And so what, what, I'm in, what I'm interested in is the idea that we don't, oftentimes we use emails and text messaging in sort of superficial and shallow ways. But in fact, if we use it properly, we can find enrichment through connecting through various mediums that we're not typically inclined to use. That's such right. and so on. I have a friend who was diagnosed with breast cancer. It'll be two years in December and thanks be to God, she's now cancer free, mm -hmm. but it was a rigorous course of treatment. She's had a lot of side effects. So even before COVID, we didn't get to see each other in person much because she was very sick and very vulnerable to infection. Right. But over these two years, our primary connection has been to text each other, um, praise songs, and hymns that give us uplift and encouragement. And it has deepened our sisterhood as, as followers of Christ. And really it's certainly deepened my faith and I believe it's deepened hers. And you're right, it was done all through text message. Yeah. So there you go. Speaking yeah. of hymns that inspire, I often ask every person I've interviewed what hymn offers inspiration and encouragement to you. And I've been told that you actually have two selections versus <laughs> requisite one, but uh, no, I, your people may not know this, but I'm not just a pastor. I was a musician first and foremost. I did a master of sacred music when I did a master of divinity. So yeah. music has always been at the heart and soul of my faith walk. I know more hymns than I probably know scriptures. Yeah. So. <laughs> but the one that has been my comfort since uh, early teenage years is um it is well with my soul. Mm. And uh, there is just something so comforting uh, that to remind that even when the storms uh, buffet and move us around, that, that it can be well with my soul, that God is still with us and helping us through. And that is a really powerful reminder. Given all the turbulence these days, both in weather and uh, forecasts and politically and so on in this country, it's nice to find that there can be calmness and wellness with our souls. Even yes. Though. Sure. Yeah. What's the other song? The other one, and this one, because I, you know, it as well is wonderful. Um, uh, it's, but it's quiet and slow and I've needed some, some enthusiasm and energizing. And the other one is actually a coaching uh, friend and clergy colleague of mine. His favorite hymn is Great is Thy Faithfulness. Mm. And it came to me early in the pandemic 
I need to hear those words, you know, great is thy faithfulness. Oh God, my father, there is no shadow of turning to thee. Um, just that whole morning by morning, new mercies I see is in the refrain. Right. And I had to look for them early in the pandemic, but getting into the discipline of looking for them has helped me to see how great God's faithfulness truly is. Amen. Thank you. Those are terrific selections. Thank you so much. Now you're primarily talking to church members, both my own and church members of other uh, area churches. Um, what advice would you offer us if we sat down and had said we need a 10 minute counseling session with you? <laughs> I would advise you to intentionally stay connected to each other right. and intentionally connect out to neighbors and friends who uh, may not have a faith community or may feel far distanced from their faith communities. Um, we are, as always, called to make disciples of all the nations, not just within our own little church community. I think reaching out to one another gives us a strong foundation so that then we have the strength to reach out to others, but we can still be reaching out and broadening God's tent and offering our service and ministry to one another beyond that tent. And that's the big piece of advice I would give. Connect so, intentionally. Sounds good. How about the five minute council for pastors? What would you uh, tell us to do? Don't go it alone. Yeah. Turn to your parishioners, turn to your colleagues, turn to your staff members. Um, I've seen church musicians become videographers. I've seen um, my minister of music at the church that I was interning at uh, became a pastoral counselor for his choir members and really grew into that role and a small group leader for them. They'd never really met as a small group, but since they can't sing together, they now meet as a small group. So if I hadn't reached out, I wouldn't have had that extra help and my little church wouldn't have had as much support as they had. So yeah, reach out and get some help. And, uh, and the other thing I'm saying to everybody is simplify wherever you can. Mm. Yeah. And what would, simplify, what would simplification look like typically for a person? Well, uh, one thing I've heard of, I have a couple of young adult friends who were busy, up and coming, you know, double income, no kids, always working 60 hour work weeks, traveling in LA traffic, three hours a day to, to and from work. Right. And they have both told me, it's brother and sister, they both live separately, they both live alone, but they have both told me in separate conversations, I'm never going back mm -hmm. to that complexity and that racing around again. Mm -hmm. So one thing in simplifying is just to slow it down yeah. Um, slow down the pace. The other thing in simplifying is um, to not try to add too many new things. So many new things have been thrust upon us and continue to be thrust upon us. I always say, if you've got one new thing and it's giving you life, stick with that one new thing That's and cool. let some of the other stuff go. Sounds like wise and sound counsel, which always comes from you, Mary. So thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. God. God bless you and your work. And God bless you and your church in your work and ministry. Thank you. New challenges, new opportunities. Camas United Methodist Church thanks you for your continued support in this time of uncertainty. And your generosity has allowed our church to be a constant center in a rapidly evolving world. Through our online presence and our virtual worship services, we can continue to be the hands and feet of Jesus in a world where faith and community are paramount. Thank you, and please remember you have the option to give generously online at www.camischurch.net or mail your checks to the Camus Church office. Thank you. When peace